to ask about that. I mean, that that covered um, some material um, on sort of broader motivations for system science. Um, and that's material that I've covered in several other courses that people might have uh, might have taken uh, here. Briefly speaking, um, it's uh, it's material for um, that that is held in common for agent-based modeling and, and discrete event modeling. But basically, it has to do with um, making choices that change things. We need models because we need to reason about the impact of our choices on the world in a world which is complex, where there's a lot of things linked together and where very simple predictions often run afoul because of unanticipated side effects. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest use of models. But there are several other uses of models that, um, uh, and there's a variety of sort of uh, issues having to do with complexity that, that relate to that. But there's, um, the overall reflection here is that in order to change things for the better, we need to understand the structure of the system, understand why it is exhibiting the behavior we see exhibited. Why do we see these problems? Why do we, we need to posit hypotheses at least for why we see the behavior that's unfavorable, the behavior we want to change for the better. Um, and uh, the fact is that when we observe things in the world, these things are typically emergent properties of some process in the world. We see behavior over time, for example, um, in terms of cycles. These may be cycles in terms of infection. So, Neil, just for this part of it, I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, uh, just showing pieces from that initial lecture I gave in the boot camp. So, so here we're talking about dynamic complexity in form of cycles. Where else do we see cycles like this? Can anyone tell me? Where else do we see pronounced cycles on a cyclic fashion over the span of many years? There's another prominent area, very much in people's minds throughout the developed world right now, where cycles like this are a cause of big problems. And it's the business cycle. So in business as well, you see pronounced patterns of, of um, a boom and bust. So there's patterns of expansion and there's patterns of collapse. And people who use the sorts of models, we'll be talking about this class, to explain those phenomena as well. Or you may see patterns like this, a rise and a decline. In this case, it's number of deaths from bubonic plague. Where else might you see a rise and decline like this in terms of sales of what? How about sales of the first generation iPhone? I bet it would look like this. Um, it would start ramping up. There's a lot of network effects here. People are talking to each other, getting excited about this new technology. Ramps up until you've penetrated a lot of the market of people who are going to buy them in the first place. And people start waiting for the next big thing. And they also you're also now dealing with people who are not so inclined to go out and buy one right away. Um, so the early adopters have adopted it. It starts to be more mainstream, and you're starting to get to people who are less impulsive buyers of new technologies. And eventually, as new technologies come in, and so on, the sales go down. Okay. So there's there's something called the Bass Diffusion Model, which characterizes this for sales, sales processes. These are again these patterns that we see come out of underlying processes. They come out of processes that are um, involved several different factors interacting over time within the world. And within agent-based modeling and system dynamics modeling, we'll see different ways of describing these processes. But the fact is that if we dealt with these things purely statistically, purely on a statistical level, we would miss an understanding of if we change this, what will change in the results? We deal with these as solitudes when really they're linked. Because if we have a number of people dying from bubonic plague that looks like this, we're going to have another graph that shows the number of people sick from bubonic plague, another graph showing the number of susceptibles. And those are all interlinked under the covers. You know, infection leads to some people recovering and some people dying. But if we just look at them as independent time series, we don't really capture that insight. And the key 
one of the key um, understandings of modeling is that these things that, that motivate us to do dynamic modeling is these things are interlinked. They're, they're resulting from some underlying process. They're, they're the different faces of the same underlying process, the different sides of it. Um, and uh, by characterizing this process, re we can reason about how to deal with it more effectively. Um, and uh, it turns out that there's a variety of challenges to it that I covered within that talk. Um, once we uh, get to dynamic models, we're dealing with representation of the causal relationships between different factors. Um, different factors that interact to yield the patterns we see. I want to emphasize here that we're talking about hypothesized relationships. Models are thinking tools. They're tools that help us reason about interpretations of how the world may work. They are rarely the final product of that thinking. The most important product of the thinking is our sharpened understanding of what's going on there. But the models help us reason through in a consistent way the implications of a hypothesis. So we may have a hypothesis that underlies you know, why we see these patterns of illness in, in um, college-aged um, college kids uh, you know, of measles reemerging. And we build a model that helps us understand that. We may have a hypothesis for why we see companies going out of business in the telecom era. Um, you know, uh, in the in the late 1990s and early, particularly early 2000s, and we may build a model that helps us explain that, helps us understand it, and the model can capture in a more consistent way than we can in our head the implications of our assumptions, and allows us to run out, as it were, simulated um, realities and understand are I hypotheses for what's going on consistent with what we see. Are they consistent with, with what our observations are? Are they consistent with our uh, understanding from knowing about different aspects of the system? Okay. So the, in order to do that, the system, we represent these causal relationships, how A impacts B. It's a mechanistic model of how things are. So that if we change A, we, we can get some understanding how B and C and D and E and F are, are all affected. Okay. Um, so models provide a way to examine the diverse consequences of changes in one area of the system to the system as a whole. So they let us understand how our interventions might affect not only the deaths from bubonic plague on the one hand, but also the, um, uh, the, the number of, of illnesses from bubonic plague, the number of, uh, uh, you know, the demand for hospitals, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, models help us and system actors to understand vulnerabilities and ways of changing the structure. Um, so we're dealing with patterns that are fundamentally emergent patterns here. They're emerging from an underlying process. We're trying to understand how to intervene. And the analogy here is simulators that are used widely in many areas of modern training. Um, surgeons now use surgical simulators. Um, people who are training to pilot planes use flight simulators. So you can understand what it's like to fly through a thunderstorm before you have to do it with a plane full of people. It's a good thing. When people are training on power plants, they use plant simulators to simulate what an emergency would be like in a nuclear power plant. What to do, how it starts behaving, and what you can do to shut things down, how quickly those things have an effect, etc. And people planning cities have, have you know, traffic simulators, etc. Um, I want to highlight just a few uses before we go on and talk about the modeling process here. So what do these models do? Well, I've, I've emphasized sort of that they serve as what-if tools. They can help us reason through the impact of our choices so that we can decide more effectively how, what to do. We could choose things that are high leverage, that make a big difference, things that are cost effective, that for a given amount of money have the biggest bang for the buck, as it were, and things that are robust, things that that given our uncertainties, they're still likely to work out no matter what our uncertainties are. Um, so whether it's a hot summer or a cold summer, that will still have an effective policy against West Nile, something like that, right? Um, so that's good. But what else do they do? Well, they help make explicit our models in our heads of causality. 
this, ladies and gentlemen, is something that system dynamics as a, as a um, sort of sub-area of modeling is traditionally emphasized a lot. The basic point here is that we go around with, with mental models. So it's not a matter from their perspective of whether, whether or not we build a model to inform our decisions. It's which model do you want to work with? A model that's trapped in your particular head, which can't be shared with anyone else, and that is simulated in only a crude way for its dynamic implications? Or do you want to make that model explicit so it can be shared, so it can be critiqued, so it can be improved over time, and so that it can be simulated in a quantitatively exact way for what its implications are? So there, the, the challenge is not so much um, uh, do we model or not? It's let's model, given that we model, let's model in the most effective way possible. Okay, so there's this notion of mental models that accompanies that. That's very important. Um, these models also help us understand trends, help us understand why we see these patterns of cyclic variation um, and make sense of, of, of what we see. Why do we see this odd phenomenon? So those of you who have no interest in health sciences and take this course purely for the model will find yourself with a set of tools that's very useful for explaining, for example, computer system dysfunction. Why is it that a server is so slow in handling these requests? Or why is it that, you know, that um, the people, uh, when they try to roll out a new, a new IT system across a company, run into such problems in... Um, in uh, transferring data over to the new system. These sort of systems issues. Um, these models can also help us prioritize research and data collection because they highlight uncertainties that matter to our decision making. Okay, So we have to make choices. Models can help us understand, get insights into the trade-off between choices, but they can help us spot which uncertainties really matter. We may be very uncertain about a quantity, but in the end, it really doesn't matter much. We may be uncertain about rainfall when it comes to West Nile infection within the province, but that turns out not to have a big impact nearly as much as temperature, perhaps. And so it's a big uncertainty. Sure, we could spend our lives researching rainfall in the prairies and patterns of rainfall, but does it impact our decision making, our choice as to which intervention to undertake and when to undertake it? No, not, it may not. So it helps us basically distinguish between uncertainties that matter and those that are second order. And it helps us understand commonalities between contexts. To what degree can we take the lessons learned from this context and use it in a different context? And finally, and this is important, anyone here from the HCI lab? Um, so in human-computer interaction um, research, there's a uh, within that broad rubric, there's a growing use of uh, simulation models to serve as communication tools. And I think a lot of the insights from HCI over the years could be leveraged to, uh, to enhance the communication that goes on. So there's a growing use of tools, for example, in healthcare that are web-enabled that are provided for broad sets of stakeholders to use um, and interact with so that they can test out um, hypotheses for, for why um, certain phenomena are seen and how their interventions will impact things. Okay? So um, communication is another big use of these models. And I've emphasized the models as dynamic hypotheses. They're, they're ways that we improve our thinking. They're ways that capture an interpretation of the world and they're best used in a kind of ecosystem where we have some mental model, we cast it into a form that's executable, where we can actually simulate it, we observe the results of that simulation, and we learn from that, but we also compare these results and our own understanding with observations in the world. Those, those, that information helps inform what we do, what information we collect, what interventions we undertake. For example, we may decide that based on the model's recommendation, we will, we will issue an advisory rather than spraying for West Nile, West Nile uh, bearing mosquitoes. And we observe the consequences and compare that with what the model would have predicted. And we refine our model. 
we further refine our model. So this is part of a big process. And the best sort of modeling goes on within a process which keeps it grounded, keeps it honest, keeps it informing real choices. Okay? And um, I'm pleased to say that within the scope of this course, within the projects that we have um, on the, the website, um, there, there are some projects which could really inform decision making uh, within the health area. Uh, here in Canada, um, there's uh, there's one involving um, uh, stray dogs in Chile that could involve you know how how dogs are treated within um, Chilean cities. There's a variety of other um, other projects which could really inform um, how things at the ministry level, at the health region level, are undertaken. So models uh, are best undertaken in this process where data can be gathered. Observations can be made, interventions can be undertaken, and compared with model results. So those were some comments from um, on sort of uh, the motive.